Hollywood fights back. This is Frederick March. So they adjourned those hearings in Washington. Why? A member of the House on American Committee said the game was postponed on account of a threatened communist invasion of Washington. Over what roads was the invasion to come, Mr. Thomas? By rail, ship, airplane, armored car, and droshki? Did you get hold of the secret road maps and the timetable of this invasion? If so, why didn't you give the details to the public? And if so, why did you close up shop in such a hurry? This is Myrna Loy. Was it really the threat of a communist invasion arming clo- army closing in on Washington? Or was it a rising t- tide of protest and indignation from the American people pouring in on the committee via angry letters, telegrams, editorials, columns, and radio commentators? Last week, a non-political group of stars, writers, directors, producers, together with scientists, senators, and men of letters, sprang into existence overnight to combat the menace of the un-American committee. We thought we were merely a few hundred people fighting for freedom of speech and conscience. But in the week that followed, we found out that we were part of a landslide of opinion against what was going on in that hearing room in Washington. This is Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., You don't have to live in Hollywood to be aroused by the proceedings of the Un-American Committee and to come out fighting. In thousands of communities throughout America, people who weren't familiar with the history and tactics of this committee watched the big show, at first with curiosity, then amazement, and then rising anger. One of the most dramatic examples of the way opinion took shape came from the city of Detroit. You readers of the editorial page of the Detroit Free Press last Sunday found support for J. Parnell Thomas and his Un-American Committee. But on the following day, After another round of hearings, well, let Rita Hayworth tell you what Detroiters found on the same editorial page of the same Detroit Free Press. Quote, The most un-American activity in the United States is the conduct of the Congressional Committee on Un-American Activities. It is so viciously flagrant a violation of every element of common decency associated with human liberty that it is foul mockery on all that Jefferson and Lincoln made articulate in their dreams of a cleaner and finer order on Earth. The hypocritically named Committee on Un-American Activity should be abolished at the earliest possible moment by the United States Congress and so deeply buried that no other group of publicity-mad zealots could ever be allowed to tarnish with their stench the greatest institution of our democracy, our halls of legislation. This is Florence Eldridge. Pick a city on the map. Miami, Chicago... Charleston, West Virginia? This is what the Charleston Daily Mail had to say. Quote, The proof of a communist menace in Hollywood would lie in the pictures produced, not in the opinion of one director concerning another's political and economic views. Hollywood, like the rest of the United States, is entitled to the widest range in political views. This is Lauren Bacall. Right smack in the heart of the nation, you people in Des Moines, Iowa, read this in the register. The Un-American Committee is determined to put the thinking and writing and the performing in Hollywood in such narrow intellectual shackles that no view can possibly be expressed except those which accord with the deadening dogmas and timid mentalities of the most reactionary fringe. This is Anne Revere. Right on the home grounds of the committee's hearings, the Washington Post took a mighty swipe at shouting Thomas. Quote, Mr. Thomas and his colleagues have been guilty of blasting individual reputations with right regard of individual rights. The spectacle of Hollywood writers and players denouncing their colleagues in an orgy of self-righteousness has only been slightly less degrading than the spectacle of a congressional committee fostering this brutal contempt for the elementary principles of fair play, unquote. This is Lon McAllister. The Chicago Times lashed out at the committee. Ditto the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Kansas City Star. Ditto the Miami Herald. Ditto the New York Times and the Herald Tribune and the Richmond News Leader. And on and on and on. This is Bert Lancaster. <clears throat> Do you read the columnists? Maybe you saw Dorothy Thompson's blast. Quote, So far, the evidence produced in the hearing is as unreliable as that of gossip writers merchandising hearsay. 
no one has been proved to be a communist, unquote. And columnist Eleanor Roosevelt, quote, what is going on in the Un-American Activities Committee worries me primarily because little people have become frightened and we find ourselves living in the atmosphere of a police state where people close doors before they state what they think or look over their shoulders apprehensively before they express an opinion, unquote. The Un-American Committee found itself under attack from many other columnists, including Pulitzer Prize winner Thomas L. Stokes, Samuel Grafton, William Shira, and Quentin Reynolds. We're only sorry that there isn't time to quote them all. This is Danny Kaye. What you've just heard is a sampling of the way Americans coast to coast responded to the alarm. Well, last week, 26 of us from Hollywood got a sampling of our own when we chartered a plane and flew across the country to Washington. We had the chance to talk to people in Kansas City, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and New York. We stuck our necks out on this trip because we expected to be called defenders of communism. We told them that we didn't defend communism. And if anyone could sit in that caucus room and hear what went on, he'd never go for any kind of dictatorship or police state. This is Evelyn Keyes. The committee room reminded me of a studio set. There were Klieg lights and two or three movie cameras directed on the committee members. And there were spotlights attached to the great crystalline chandeliers that hung from the high ceiling. At first, it was unreal. I had a hard time believing that this was an actuality instead of a scene on a stage. It didn't take me long to see that the Un-American Committee was making a production of an inquisition and that they were asking questions to which they had already decided the answers. This is Paul Henreid. Chairman Thomas accepted statements from all the friendly witnesses, but refused to let all but two of the so-called unfriendly witnesses read their prepared statements. Protests were gaveled down. After one witness was escorted by police from the stand, I heard Mr. Thomas say something to this effect, quote, You've heard the record of this witness, and you've heard him cite the Bill of Rights. Now that's just following the Communist Party line, and the evidence clearly indicates that he is a communist. And I got to thinking, if I talk about the Bill of Rights, am I a communist? And suddenly I felt just as hemmed in as some of the witnesses must have felt. When I walked out of the hearing room, I, I felt less of a free man than when I walked in. But I will continue to believe in the Bill of Rights more strongly than ever. And I will say so to anyone, anywhere. This is June Havoc. Mr. Thomas says his committee is an impartial fact-finding body. Well, here are Groucho Marx and Keenan Wynn to demonstrate for you the impartiality of the chairman to his witnesses, as we heard it in Washington said the chairman to a friendly witness. You may read your statement. Said the chairman to an unfriendly witness. You may not read the statement. I read the first line. To a friendly witness. Will you tell us, in your opinion... To an unfriendly witness. If you want to make a speech, we'll find you a street corner. Friendly. Thanks for coming. Now you may go back and make enough money to pay off that libel suit. Unfriendly. Stand away from that chair. Stand away from that chair. Friendly. Sir, would you say that he is a communist? Unfriendly. You will not accuse anybody. Friendly. Surely your memory isn't that bad. Uh, can't you think it over and uh, give us a list? Unfriendly. How long will it take you? Friendly. I beg your pardon, sir. Unfriendly. You will not ask anything. Friendly. Do you think, sir? Unfriendly. We'll determine when it's proper. Friendly. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the following sentence of 14 words by actual count... Shouted by the chairman at an unfriendly witness. No, 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 no. This is Humphrey Bogart. We sat in the committee room and heard it happen. We saw it. We said to ourselves, it can happen here. We saw American citizens denied the right to speak by elected representatives of the people. We saw police take citizens from the stand like criminals after they'd been refused the right to defend themselves. We saw the gavel of a committee chairman cutting off the words of free Americans. The sound of that gavel, Mr. Thomas, rings across America. Because every time your gavel struck, it hit the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. This is John Houston. One thing must be made clear. We went on this trip to Washington. We who went were not supported by any other group or committee. We chartered our own plane and paid our own way. And at no time were we represented by legal counsel. 
we acted as representatives of the hundreds of people in Hollywood who feel as we do and hold no affiliation with any political organization. As free American citizens, we observed the proceedings at the hearings in the House Un-American Committee Room. And then we filed a petition with the Clerk of the House of Representatives, a petition for redress of grievances, and was signed by all of us and by all who have joined the Committee for the First Amendment. This is Marcia Hunt. The petition said in part, We, the undersigned citizens of the United States, residing in the state of California, do hereby respectfully petition the Honorable Joseph W. Martin, Jr. and our representatives in Congress for redress of our grievances, as we are privileged to do by the First Amendment of the Constitution. In our opinion, the procedures adopted by the House Committee on Un-American Activities have persistently violated the civil liberties of American citizens to the end that today no citizen is secure from informers, spies, invasions of privacy, and other violations that are common usually to dictatorships and police states. As citizens of the first and greatest democracy, we believe that every social problem can be solved by the democratic process, provided that the ballot remains secret and inviolable, and provided that all media of expression remain free of intimidation or coercion by any agency of the government. This is Heard Hatfield. In the midst of a rising tide of protest, the hearings are suddenly called off. The long-awaited sensational evidence of a Hollywood spy ring turns out to be, or is alleged to be, a man who is alleged to know somebody, who allegedly knew somebody, who allegedly knew somebody in Hollywood. Chairman Thomas announces the first phase of the investigation is over. But it is not over, not by a long shot. It is just beginning. You can't dump a bucket of red paint over a city and its citizens and run off like a bunch of Halloween pranksters. There are still a lot of questions that demand answers. Here are some. This is Peter Lorre. Why, if these hearings were so important to the security of America, were they attended only by a fraction of the committee's total membership? And why was John Rankin, co-chairman of this committee, and you know who he is, absent from all the hearings? Why? This is Burl Ives. Why, if the hearings were conducted impartially... Did a friendly witness pose for pictures with two children of committee members sitting on his lap? And why, if these hearings were conducted impartially, did Chairman Thomas take friendly witnesses aside to confer with them in whispers and congratulate them, as reported by Drew Pearson? This is Geraldine Brooks. Why were all friendly witnesses allowed to make statements? And a majority of so-called unfriendly witnesses denied this right a right given even to rabble-rouser Gerald L.K. Smith, whom the committee excused with a polite thank you. And why was the committee unable to point to any specific character, any single line, scene, or even so much as a word of any picture which was un-American? This is Jane Wyatt. On the plane trip back from Washington, the people we met asked more questions. Some of them asked, why didn't the witnesses answer yes or no the way the committee wanted them to answer? Why did they keep talking about the Bill of Rights? Now, I don't know the fine points of law, but if anybody in this land knows them, it should be the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Well, on the day we left Washington, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas spoke to an audience in Providence, Rhode Island, and said that men who insist on the protection of constitutional rights are often severely criticized. He said, quote, They are, in fact, frequently dubbed communists, fellow travelers, or other subversive agents. Certainly, he who maintains that the Bill of Rights should be enforced with vigor is championing the democratic scheme of things, not communism or fascism, unquote. This is Vanessa Brown. Everybody in the country seems to want to know the legality of the issue at stake. To give you an authoritative answer, we take you now to Washington to hear from the former Assistant Attorney General of the United States, Thurman Arnold. This is Thurman Arnold speaking. The Committee on Un-American Activities is engaged in an inquisition of the motion picture industry designed to spread suspicion, distrust, and intolerance. It violates the spirit of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees to every American the sacred right of either disclosing his opinions and his affiliations or keeping them to himself. Without shadow of proof that motion pictures have been made the vehicles of communist propaganda, 
They are inquiring into the trade union memberships and political affiliations of the men who make these pictures. If this sort of inquisition can go on in America, our great personal freedoms of speech, religion, and political association are in grave danger. This is Frank Gervasi. The atmosphere in the room where the Committee on Un-American Activities interrogated those Hollywood people was familiar. It was not physically familiar, but it was spiritually familiar. I thought for a moment. Suddenly I remembered. I had seen it all before in Mussolini's Rome and Hitler's Berlin. Here, as in the capitals of totalitarian nations, men were pushing other men around, trying to tell them what to think. Who's next? The newspapers? The magazines? The radio? This is Arthur Webb, Washington correspondent of the London Daily Herald. I should like to quote from an editorial of my paper published last Monday. Damage has already been done to the reputation of the United States as a democracy by the antics of the Congress Committee on Un-American Activities. When we in this country read of Hollywood personalities being accused of dangerous thinking, we begin to wonder what is happening today in the United States. Has political thinking become an offense in the country that boasts of being the world's greatest democracy? In Britain, anyone is free to hold or preach whatever political views he likes. May that right ever remain undisturbed. We take you now to New York and a man who only recently left Washington. This is Gene Kelly. Last week at this time, I spoke to you as I was leaving for Washington. You've already heard from others who were on the trip a little of what we found and what people along the way had to say about things. I wanted to tell you more. But yesterday in Philadelphia, an 81-year-old former United States attorney expressed the feelings of all of us as he was under violent physical attack while addressing a meeting in Independence Square. He said, we are standing in front of the Hall of Independence, a symbol of liberty won for the United States generations ago. I should remind the members of this generation that the liberty of the United States is in danger if intolerance is permitted. If a person won't tolerate differences of opinion, there will be liberty no more in the land. This is Herbert Lehman. No one questions the right of Congress to investigate violations of law and threats to our form of government. It has that right, certainly. But in our representative democracy, rights also impose duties. The power to investigate carries with it the duty to avoid injustice and intimidation and to protect every man in the rights guaranteed him under our Constitution and statutes. Anyone publicly accused must have the right to defend himself and his point of view. That seems to me to be the very essence of democracy. The committee, throughout its much publicized investigation, has obviously refused to recognize that right and has constantly flouted the Constitution under which it serves. This is Leland Stowe. What does Congressman Thomas mean, says my taxi driver? You mean a guy can accuse me of anything and I get no chance to defend myself? If that's American, I'm Hitler. The taxi driver spoke for millions of Americans, for freedom to think, for the American right to talk back, the right to talk back in self-defense. When congressmen preserve that, they'll be acting American. This is George Kaufman. This past week, we have seen government by gavel. We've seen a thousand years of common law overridden by a congressional committee. We've seen the beginnings of a shabby melodrama with Mr. Thomas playing the part of prompter. Surely in this country we don't need a prompter to give us our political views. We must see to it that this un-American spectacle does not become a continuous performance. This is Moss Hart. A few months ago I also worked in Hollywood. I did the screenplay on Gentleman's Agreement. I was very proud to work on such a project. I was very proud that Hollywood had the courage to make a film showing the truth about that insidious disease, religious bigotry. Perhaps I was fortunate to finish that project before Mr. Thomas began his fantastic hearings, since there seems to be evidence that a motion picture which tells the truth about our country, right or wrong, is considered heresy by the Committee on Un-American Affairs. This is Richard Rogers, who dislikes communism as much as witch hunts. Well, the witch hunt is off, temporarily. In the meantime, you and I must ask ourselves this question. Are we Americans trading our soapbox for the hooded sheet? Are we being frightened out of our constitutional right to sound off? Do we really believe in the method of the ballot box? 
It's pretty obvious that the men who are running this investigation, and a lot more men, are silently nodding their approval. Would like a country where only one point of view is tolerated. You and I are the only ones who can answer these men. I suggest we think it over. This is Leonard Bernstein. That most un-American of all committees has sent out its investigators. There has been great fanfare. They have promised sensational exposés of underground plots and spy rings. Well, they have uncovered a poem, a sheet of music, the fact that a composer and a playwright had a quiet evening together, playing chess. The next step is to have our music examined measure for measure. I, for one, confidently await this examination. Gentlemen of the committee... The subversiveness of my Jeremiah Symphony awaits your judgment. This is Bennett Cerf. The ostensible purpose of the House Committee on Un-American Activities Investigation of Hollywood was to expose its alleged domination by communist elements. What the committee succeeded principally in accomplishing, however, was to give the American public a graphic picture of fascism in action. It was a warning that will not go unheeded. If Hollywood can be bullied into producing only the kind of stories that fall in with this committee's opinions and prejudices, it seems obvious to me that the publishers of books, magazines, and newspapers will most certainly be next on the agenda. This is Clifton Fadiman. The central objection to the Thomas Committee is simple. Its methods tend to encourage the totalitarianism it claims to fight. Because I am opposed to all forms of totalitarianism... I regret its proceedings. It may help to make martyrs out of a small group. Surely that cannot be your object, Mr. Thomas. But it may also help to dishearten the large group of decent and useful men and women of the motion picture industry. Surely that cannot be your object, Mr. Thomas. Tyrannies feed on fear, and your committee is spreading fear. That may not be its object. It is, however its effect. And now we take you to Hollywood for the voice of the world-famous novelist Thomas Mann. This is Thomas Mann speaking. I have the honor to expose myself as a hostile witness. I testify that I'm very much interested in the moving picture industry and that since my arrival in the United States nine years ago, I have seen a great many Hollywood films. If communist propaganda had been smuggled into any of them, it must have been most thoroughly hidden. I, for one, never noticed anything of the sort. I testify, moreover, that to my mind, the ignorant and superstitious persecution of the believers in a political and economic doctrine, which is, after all, the creation of great minds and great thinkers, and which has its adherents everywhere on earth, I testify that this persecution is not only degrading for the persecutors themselves, but also very harmful to the cultural reputation of this country. As an American citizen of German birth, I finally testify that I am painfully familiar with certain political trends. Spiritual intolerance, political inquisition, and declining legal security. And all this in the name of an alleged state of emergency. That's how it started in Germany. What followed was fascism, and what followed fascism was war. This is Dana Andrews. The un-American committee have recessed because they think they got what they were after. Censorship, blacklists, people fired from their jobs and a blanket of fear smothering free speech, free thought, and free motion pictures. Mr. Thomas's last words were a threat. Quote, Hollywood better clean house. We're not through. Unquote. But far from intimidating Hollywood, Mr. Thomas got these ringing words from Mr. Samuel Goldwyn, executive producer of the picture, The Best Years of Our Lives. Quote, I defy anyone to point out a single thing in any picture I have ever made which could justifiably be called subversive or un-American, 
by anyone, even including various publicity-hungry, self-righteous, would-be thought censors who have appeared before the committee. While many of us have been trying to build up an appreciation of America through this far-reaching medium of entertainment, I regret to say that the committee seems to have been doing its very best to undermine and destroy these efforts of our industry. Unquote. This is Helen Gehagen Douglas. As a member of the House of Representatives, I have consistently voted to abolish the Committee on Un-American Activities because I believe that the committee as set up cannot avoid violating our guaranteed liberties. The committee establishes arbitrary standards of Americanism based upon the personal prejudices and whims of its members rather than upon a specific and legal interpretation of subversiveness. This method of procedure opens the floodgates to intolerance and persecution. I believe that we weaken our democracy by adopting measures which are foreign to our traditional concepts of justice and fair play. This is Gregory Peck. In the midst of the Un-American Committee hearings came a long-awaited report from the President's Commission on Civil Rights, headed by Charles E. Wilson of General Electric, and including among its members the Right Reverend Henry Knox Sherrill, Bishop of the Episcopal Church of Boston, and President Frank T. Graham of the University of North Carolina, the President's Commission warned the nation sharply that, quote, a state of near hysteria over so-called communists in this country threatens the freedom of other citizens, unquote. And as an ominous punctuation to that report, yesterday a mob broke up a peaceable meeting, not in the city of Munich, but in the city of Philadelphia, in Independence Square, ironically in the shadow of our Liberty Bell. So the Un-American Committee bears its tragic fruit. A word flung hysterically in a hearing room becomes a stone flung deliberately in a public square. This is Dorothy McGuire. For 175 years, men have worked in this land to shape the nation. Freedom didn't just come to, down to us like the rains. We fought for it. And once we had our freedom, we had to learn that it wasn't something a man could put away and forget about. Freedom has to be brought in again each year like a new crop. Freedom has to be watched over. There is more than one way to lose your liberty. It can be torn out of your hands by a tyrant, but it can also slip away day by day while you're too busy to notice. In another time of crises... A president and a soldier named Abraham Lincoln carved these words into the history of our country. Trample on the rights of those around you, and you have lost the genius of your own independence and become the fit subjects of the first cunning tyrant who rises among you. This is Richard Conte. In the past 30 minutes, you have heard a broadcast bought and paid for by American citizens who have come on the air to protest against the abuse of American democratic rights. Mr. Thomas has said that his committee will be back. When he comes back, we will be back. And in the meantime, we hope that you, wherever you are, will join the swelling ranks of those who demand that the Un-American Committee, which has aroused such indignation and unrest across America, be abolished. Not merely reshuffled, but voted out of existence. Write to the Speaker of the House, Joseph Martin, Washington, D.C., and tell him so. Do it now. And if you wish to join your efforts with us in the fight for the America we love, write to us, the Committee for the First Amendment, Hollywood, California. <laughs> 